Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Friday Lecture Series, Department of Art and Art History, UNC Charlotte. Um, I'm here with John Grady, who's coming to us from uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, John is the recipient of the 2010 Metcalf Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He's been awarded a Tiffany Foundation, as well as three Andy Warhol Foundation grants, two Pollock Krasner Foundation grant, grants, and was the 2011 Arlene Schnitzer Prize from uh, Portland Art Museum in Oregon. Um, he's got a number of other accolades and some great work to show us. He's actually installing a sculpture next month in, in Charlotte in Marsh Park. Um, please welcome John Grady. Hi, John. Hi, thank you for the introduction, Eric. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. I, I sure wish that we could be in person um, and that I could look at a lot of your work and have a more traditional visit with the school, but glad we get to do this. Um, my thought with our time together was that um, I would give you an overview of some of the different themes that I'm investigating and then also try to kind of tap on some of of course, the why of what I'm making, but also how and how things have evolved from what was really a very solitary practice uh, not so long ago for me. Um, just 12 years ago, I really worked uh, by myself and did all my work without any help. And now I work with a, a group of 20 employees in my studio and many other collaborators. So I kind of like to walk through how that has changed. And um, what I'll focus on really are two primary projects. I'll go into greater depth with those, but then I will um, also start just showing you some small images of, of earlier work. So this first image is an image of me walking out into Willapa Bay with a sculpture on my back. And it was the first project I made where I started taking um, projects directly into the, the natural world, into the environment to see how they would interact and change. So if you go to the next image, Eric, you can see these two horn-like forms put on a form in these oyster beds so that um, the, the point of the project was to have a kind of an imprint from the environment within this place. So it stayed here for about a year and a half until oysters grew on it that were large enough that I was able to bring some friends out. And we kind of had a formal feast around the sculpture shucking oysters as the tide came up and eventually to our waists and then it was time to finish dinner. Um, I then put these forms on the front of my pickup truck, um, sort of Texas Longhorn style, and drove it about 800 miles to a desert in Utah, where it had a whole nother journey, where eventually all of these crustaceans were picked off by uh, desert wrens. So it was a kind of a, an early idea of how to compare two environments with a sculptural object. And if we go to the next image, Eric, um, this is a piece called Host. And this was a piece that was designed to be eaten by birds. So it's entirely edible. It's up in an aspen grove just north of the Grand Canyon. And um, one of the curious things that happened with this was that before birds could start getting to it, um, a lot of ground squirrels started eating it, which really wasn't my intention. I, I like the idea that I put something out in the environment and that it's temporary and it's this sort of poetic conceit on my part, my part but then these birds, eat the piece, digest it, and essentially just shit it across the landscape. You know, this is what they do with my idea. And so for that to happen with these little ground squirrels, it really was a divergence. So I spoke with an ornithologist and we just put capsicum, a, a hot pepper derivative over the surface, which mammals don't want, can't tolerate, but the birds don't notice. So it ended up working out well for the birds to eat it. So if we go to the next image, next image is from a, a, a series of works um, that I made, they were all designed to be buried and um, eaten or digested by termites. So this is a piece, the first in the series, where I took a rubber mold of my body and stretched it over a form. And then on that mold accumulated um, thousands and thousands of unique little cross section squares of different species of wood. And I then poured a clear resin between all of those squares. And if we go to the next image, you can see the piece as it's broken apart. Um, before we broke it apart and buried it for the termites, it was shown in New York in a gallery and then at a number of different museums. So it kind of had this life where people could look at the thing and know and anticipate what was going to happen, that it was going to be buried. Um, when it was buried, um, here you're seeing us put it into the ground. 
Um, termites are, are averse to light. So they're basically working their way down from the, the ground into the lower sections. And through tests, prior to making the piece, I, I did tests in about seven different Western states, did different types of termite terrain to find essentially the most aggressive termites that I could find. So even though these are the most aggressive, and this is in Northern Idaho, um, this piece has been buried now for about nine years. It, it's probably going to take another 15 years until we exhume it and um, we can see all of the, the burrowing through of the termites have made. The, the resin between the wood will keep the structural integrity to the piece. If we go to the next image, um, this is a piece called Seeps of Winter and it's derived from a collection of poems by a poet named Seamus Haney, and um, in particular about an Irish landscape and my thinking about what it would be like to be underneath layers of bog over thousands of years as very thin microscopic layers develop above your head and you're seeing these thin pores of light come through. Um, I kind of wanted to start with this as the first large scale piece I showed you too because um, some of the things I'm going to show you are just very expensive to make, but this is a piece that I had a budget of $5,000 to make, and um, I did that because it's made in, entirely with uh, recycled newspaper pulp. So I kind of rigged up a, an outboard motor as an, an enormous blender and um, pulped up a lot of newspaper along with a few additives to give it a little bit of integrity like methyl cellulose binders. And, created this very large scale temporary sculpture in an in a interior exhibition space. If we go to the next image, this is sort of building on some of that vocabulary, but introducing technology in a way um, that was novel for me at the time. This is a piece that is about seven years old, eight years old, and it's called Capacitor and um, it's kinetic. So it hinges, if you look at the left side of the sculpture and you've got those, those four sort of fluted forms, each of them hinge upright um, up toward the top as do all of the other forms. So the whole piece is essentially kind of opening and closing very slowly, almost like it's breathing. And the logic to how that happens is based on uh, climate sensors that are immediately outside the museum. So the sensors are, are gauging every five minutes what the wind speed is and what the temperature is in that environment. And we wrote some software, um, some collaborators helped me with this to look at historic norms. So we've got temperature and wind records for these locations that this was shown that give us what, it, what it, a norm would have been every 15 minutes. So we would compare the norm to what it actually was. And to the degree that we deviated from that norm, it would either open more quickly or slowly. It would also pulse with light a little bit more intensely or less intensely. Um, so technology after this point becomes central to a lot of work and I'll touch on that as we go more deeply into some of the projects. In our next image, this is, uh, this is the project that I'm gonna go into with a little bit more depth. Um, it's a piece called the elephant bed. And it's, uh, we're seeing a, a, an exhibition space that's a deconsecrated church. So about a 400 year old church in Brighton. So near London, right on the, the English Channel, right on the sea. And um, what you're seeing in the foreground is a walled off uh, half of the church that I flooded with India ink. And these large forms that you're seeing are actually made of a, a paper-like substance. We could go to the next image and see a closer view of them. Um, it feels, it feels like paper, but it's, it's binderless. It's a product called Dissolvo. And it has these sort of limited industrial uses for purge damming when you're welding. But the, the unique feature of this, this product is that because it's binderless, it's also designed to be environmentally benign. You introduce this to water systems, like you can put it in a lake and it disintegrates into very, very fine particles, which are essentially just a, a fine wood product. So it's designed to go into municipal water systems. So what I did with this, we can see the next image. Um, we got a little bit of video and we'll see if, if it's, a, it's a low res video. Hopefully it'll, it'll make it through. But you can see that these move quite easily with just the, the littlest bit of draft. So as a person walks through the space, um, they'll start to spin. Each of them, even though they're 25 feet tall, weighs only eight pounds. And you're seeing here that each of these pieces is suspended by one thin line of filament up, up to the rafters of the, the church. And 
each of those lines of filament goes through a pulley and then all of the lines through a second pulley go directly above the pulpit in this church and then they drop down. So it was an interactive piece where if people come in, again, half of this church is blocked off and flooded with India ink, but the other half you can walk through easily and interact with the sculptures. Um, we can go to the, the next image, um, but you can walk up to this pulpit and from the pulpit, you can interact by either pulling or releasing the lines of each of these. So you can pull them up to allow people to stand comfortably within each of these, or you can drop them down into that India ink. And then the India ink sort of leached up into the product and, and also sucked it down a little bit further. So it really didn't take too long before the 10 of the 20 that were above India ink had completely dissolved into that India ink. And if we go to the next image, um, what you'll see on this image on the left, well, this is a, an image that's showing us what it looks like for a couple of people to stand inside the image just to give you a better sense of scale. But the next image you'll see on the left is a satellite view of Great Britain. And on the right, you're seeing um, a microscopic view of the, the organism that inspired it. They're called coccolithophore and they're a type of phytoplankton. And this is the little calcium shell that, that holds their organism together. And they derive all their energy from the sun and they float in mass, just trillions of these small organisms in the sea, just a couple of inches below the surface of the sea. And because there are so many of them, they displace light below. And so there's a, a kind of a complicated thing that's going on with the environment where we're getting larger and larger blooms of these organisms, and then they die off. And so all of those turquoise areas you're seeing on the shore are these very large blooms. And what I found really kind of compelling were both the environmental um, issues that were raised by the, the greater and greater blooms of these, but also the idea of how they died off. I, I sort of imagined myself being able to be inside something that's so microscopic, I can't see it with my eye. And being part of this thing where as they die off, they all slowly float to the bed of the ocean below. So I wanted to bring people inside uh, one of these forms. And if we go to the next image, um, the other kind of tie and, and the reason for the, the piece call, being called the elephant bed is that geologists in this area where you have the white cliffs of Dover, they call the strata um, of white calcium deposits that make up these cliffs, the elephant bed. And these cliffs and these deposits are all made from the, the small skeletons of these coccolithophore that, that I'm bringing people inside of to inhabit. So it's a way of just understanding that immediate environment through its history and its biology, making its geology. So if we go to the next image, um, part of the challenge with this, you're seeing um, my relying on about 80 different volunteers in this area in Brighton, almost all artists. So I showed up with what was essentially a very large origami project. So everything had to fit into two suitcases in British Air. And then I bring out all these flat pieces with a number of jigs and clips. And we assemble all of these pieces together over about a two week period. And it was the first time I had done something like this where I'm relying on a lot of people that I don't know to help me make a project. And this has been something that's developed in my work to the point where in a more recent project, we had over 4,000 people help to build the sculpture. So there's a kind of a, a letting go and a, and a lack of control. And then this also wonderful influence of seeing how people respond to a system so that you can think about how to make that different the next time you do it. Um, and if we go to the next image, um, you're seeing here what it looks like when that ink leaches up and we can even go to the next and you'll see where the, the dissolvo starts to break apart here into that India ink. And it really just takes a few seconds for it to, to break up. So after about a six week run with the exhibition, we no longer had half of the sculptures. They had all dissolved into the India ink, but we still had the other 10. So I returned uh, again on British Air with my two suitcases. And this time uh, we can go to the next image. Uh, I showed up with a bunch of telescoping pieces of uh, bamboo. And the idea with bringing this was that I could create these structures that were stronger than the sculptures themselves that we could slide in. And you can just kind of go through the next two or three fairly quickly. You can see that we put a person inside each of these 10. I was one of those 10 people as well. And we can keep going through the next two images. Um, 
and one further. So we created these forms and were then able to, because they supported the sculptures, tilt them out the back of this church and into the city lanes. And if we go to the next image, you'll see as these start to assemble, um, one of the things that was kind of humorous about this is because they're so top heavy, you had to have a minder. So you see the person with a tall bamboo stick with a leash that kind of held the thing about 12 feet above the ground so you didn't tip over. And uh, we can go to the next image to see what it looks like moving through these city streets. You're very vulnerable as this happens. If it were to start raining, these would all just melt instantly in the streets. So we walked about uh, half a mile and then carried these things directly into the English Channel where the sculptures disintegrated in about you know, 15 seconds. You can go to the next image and see what those looked like as they were falling. So I wasn't, I didn't wanna be the person leading this procession. I was much more interested in being one of the people that was inside these sculptures as this happened. So you have your minder with your leash who's kind of helping you navigate where to walk. And then you have this kind of wonderful experience walking into the sea and being turned upside down by the waves. We had um, an underwater uh, film crew because I really wanted to see what this would look like as these were disintegrating underwater. But unfortunately, uh, the waves were too strong for us to get good footage. If, if we go to the next image, um, I was given an opportunity to, to realize the piece a second time in a second venue. And this was a museum that it was actually the inaugural exhibition of this, this museum. And it had these polished black floors and we just made walls for our ink that were only about a foot tall. You can kind of see them there. And unfortunately, the opening event was, was huge. There must've been 7,000 people. Uh, we had 20 some people fall into this ink. So it was, um, it, you know, not a great thing. There was a, a small baby, I think a one and a half year old baby that crawled through and no, nobody was really hurt, but there was this, kind of entertaining moment where this man with white pants was kind of having a moment, moment with one of these spinning sculptures and is getting a little too close and he fell into the ink. And uh, this was in October, November. And there was a woman standing next to me who I hadn't met. She didn't know I was the artist. And she just kind of turned to me and said, you know, that man has no business wearing white pants in the fall anyway. So he had black pants after he had, he had fallen in. Um, so I think we have one more image, yeah, where you can see them being reflected in the ink. And then just to follow one last thread with this project, if we go to the next image, um, I was invited to create sets for a ballet. Um, this is the Portland Ballet. And um, it was an interesting challenge to sort of think about the why of that piece and, and, and how important it was for me to envelop people. So this ballet, uh, I worked with the choreographer who was very interested in Greek myth. We can go to, to the next image. Um, so what was important to me was to bring these dancers inside and outside uh, these spinning forms. And here we see one of the dancers and we can go to the next image. Um, and over the, the production of the ballet, you're seeing um, each of these forms um, basically enveloping the dancers. Uh, so in the next two images, you'll see that happening. So you don't see it here, but most of the dancers have already been enveloped apart from this one dancer here. And then in the final image, I think we can see a sense that they start to collapse so that they go all the way to the ground. And at the end of the ballet, all you see are these kind of white mounds marking where the dancers used to be. And I think we had one more image on this. So before I'm, I'm gonna launch into another project called Reservoir, but I wonder if this might be a moment if anybody has any kind of feedback or questions, we could just pause just to make it, things a little bit more interactive, either about this specific sort of series of projects or anything in general about the work. Make sure my sound is working. Sorry, John. Um, let me let me um, bring up. Uh, I'm gonna just come out of this really quick and see if we have any questions. Um, this tops the share here. Um, let's see. We have one question that just came in. Um, have you ever thought of? Um, it, you know, a lot of your work seems based on, you know, uh, 
geology and biological forms from, you know, from uh, your environment. Have you ever thought about, you know, even expanding these, making these more fantastic and referencing, you know, kind of alien landscapes? And, and then there was a question about that I think relates, like, where do you get your inspirations from? And I, I think you addressed that a little bit with the cellular forms, but maybe mm -hmm. you want to talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So the, the alien forms is an interesting one. Um, there was a, a glancing blow with Elon Musk and his group asking um, about the idea of my actually sending a piece out into orbit, <laughs> which had, certainly at this point hasn't happened. Um, I know there are artists that are exploring that. And I found that really interesting because um, I'm really interested in in directly in, in engaging the landscape and then engaging different landscapes like I just briefly touched on with the, the collector project at the very beginning. So I really like the idea of what is that context to be just off of the earth into that that wider that wider place. Um, it has I haven't gone into sort of you know sci-fi into that realm but it's interesting how in some projects um, that has been an association and and I think what that also speaks to for me is in, in a lot of the desire for me to make these projects very large scale. I found that when I was making things at a smaller scale, people tended to sort of project them as larger objects. And so if they are already larger objects, we can then experience them that way and get everything from that. So that was a kind of a lead off from that. Um, and maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll kind of tackle the, the inspiration question a little bit more as I go, certainly with this next yeah. one, and then maybe we pick that up a little bit more at the very end too. Sure, sure. So just, I, you kind of uh, just mentioned it, but so Elon Musk wanted you to make a satellite for him. Is that what you, is like <laughs> a satellite right. sculpture or? So, and it's not a conversation like Elon doesn't just give me a call. It's not that kind of a thing, it, you know, right. curious, but no, it was the idea that, that a piece of sculpture be brought out into orbit. Oh, so, cool. So really interesting set of, of um, logistics where you need to make something that it's not going to weigh much. It can be very small. And then it probably wants to expand when it gets out there. So hasn't, hasn't gone anywhere. Maybe it will, but I, I really liked the unusual criteria. Um, yeah, yeah. How to contend with that. Yeah, I could see like the uh, elephant bed pieces up in space, then like collecting all that space garbage, right? And <laughs> kind of recontracting. That's great. Right, right. Well, I'll, I'll get us back to the presentation. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Let's see. You seeing that, John? Yeah, Is, okay. Yeah, so if we do our next image, we'll be on a uh, the first image for a piece called Reservoir. And so this is a piece that was commissioned by a sculpture park called Articella, and it's in the north of Italy. And it's a, it's a pretty exquisite place if anybody has a chance to go. If you're in Venice, it's a two hour train ride up into the Dolomite Mountains. And you, you spend a day there. It's, it's a kind of experience where you're going through a long valley with very tall mountains on either side. And then it's both wooded and open pasture land. And it's just the Italians live so well. They've got a place to get espresso or a drink or a meal every mile or so. You just pause, so you see families. It's a, a wonderful place with really high quality art. And it, 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 it spoke to me so directly because really their mantra is, is to make things that engage the landscape. And so what we're seeing with this piece Reservoir, which was installed a couple of years ago, is my investigation into interacting with um, rain and snow and, and wind in that environment. So what, what you're seeing are a pair of, of uh, custom made nets. Um, and within these nets are suspended 5,000 uh, small forms. So if we go to the, the next image, you'll sort of see with this, this slow video, what each of these forms look like. And these are forms that are inspired by the, the gesture, if you can see me in the video of, of putting two hands together like this. So it's a, it's a kind of a cupping of your hands to receive the rain. And, and so what happens with each of these forms, um, they're, they're clear plastic that's heat formed around this salvaged Alaskan yellow cedar that's heat bent into these cup-like forms so that the top is, is, is latching onto the net. And if, if we go to the next image, um, what ends up happening is that these collect water when it rains. So the, 
the sculpture is suspended by the, the two nets. And I don't know if we can get to that next image, but maybe it just has to play through this whole video. Um, but here you see from the ground in this forest, we're attaching these two nets, one's above the other, to nine of these different trees. And we then have lines running down from the trees so that we can raise and lower the piece manually if we want to. But otherwise, what we've got are these, these wonderful spring mechanisms, which allow, as this, this sculpture starts to take on weight, these springs start to expand and they've got along each of these tree trunks, they've got about a 15 foot range. So if you look at the next image, you'll see the same, same sculpture, but as it starts to accumulate water, the forms of each of the nets not only begin to contort and create unique shapes, because in this environment, it doesn't rain the same way every time. It's, it's kind of wonderful. You'll see within the sculpture, it takes on completely different sags and bulges and, and, and shape. Um, but then it also has this range of, of almost 15 feet where the top and bottom start to, to differentiate from one another. Um, so the sculpture, when it's dry, weighs about 80 pounds. When it's um, full of water, it's almost 1,000 pounds. I think it's 900 and some pounds. And, and wonderfully, this was kind of a risk on my part, you will get this completely full of rain in a, an afternoon thunder shower in just 45 minutes. And throughout the summer, they've been having these, these thunder shower events um, more and more increasingly with, with climate change. So it's a very dynamic changing piece when, when you're seeing it really throughout the year, but especially in the summer and fall. And if we go to the next image, you can see the, the, the forms um, superimposed one over the other when you're, well, this is, I guess, more of a detail shot of, of what these, these different cup forms look like. And we can just keep going through the next couple of slides. Um, so in making these, these forms, um, it was important for me to have a range of people that we derived the, the heat forming um, cup form. So there were 12 different people in my studio. Here you see a couple people from my group um, where we're making the nets. So we model the nets in, in the computer and then cut the different forms and sew together segments. We can go to the next image. Um, and in this next image, you're seeing the, the net itself. Um, and this is one of the one of the guys on my team, Sam. And so we have a center ring that we're we're building all this on, on the ground. And then we go up into the trees. Uh, we rig up into the trees and with lifts attach them to the trees in the next image. And so this gives you a sense of of what it looks like without all of the forms attached to the net form that we made. And then in the next image, um, you can see it once we remove the tape, which marks all the seams. So I kind of liked it just like this, just as this form. But of course, it was important for me that this piece interact and change with, with precipitation. Um, then we can go to the next image. And this next image will show you um, this also great interactive piece where we had many people from the community and the 50 some employees from the sculpture park all involved in hanging these these thousands of pieces on the net on the ground and then we we raised it back up and in the next image what was also um, an opportunity I saw was as I was building this and thinking through the form and what the piece wanted to be I was working with a choreographer and dance has become an important part with a, a whole number of my projects so as we inaugurated the piece here, and you can see it in its wider context, we had um, several dancers and then several people supporting those dancers. So we bypassed the spring mechanism um, for the sculpture and instead it was manually lowered and raised so that the choreographer composed a dance with dancers below it and was able to slowly bring and rapidly bring the sculpture above down directly toward the ground and into their space and really um, fortunately we had the piece completely full of water so they could do dynamic things like jerk the piece and sort of douse the different um, performers with water at different points according to, to his choreography. And if we go to the next image, we can just go through the next four images fairly rapidly. They're just going to show you detail and slowly back up and view so you get a, a further and further view of what the sculpture looks like. Sorry, John, I, I just I had a question. So there's the netting and then the cups are are made from um, uh, what are those those made from? Uh, is that more of the netting than like in in the individual forms or? No, each of the individual forms is made out of a heat formed plastic. 
Um, and then that plastic is heat formed over a small wood linear element. And the use of plastic was an interesting one. My, um, my go-to with plastic has been in two directions in the past. It's either to reuse existing, like I did a piece where we, we cut up thousands of plastic water bottles and heat formed them. Um, and then the other direction I would normally go in would be to use a biodegradable plastic. So this is a, a you know, awful plastic that is not biodegradable. We can certainly recycle it when we're done with it. Um, but the choice to make use of this plastic as, a, as opposed to a biodegradable plastic came from the structure of this project, which is really unusual. So Articella asked me not just to come and make this one sculpture. Um, you can keep going through the next couple images too as I talk. Um, but to think about this is the first iteration of the sculpture that we're gonna make. So I'm right now designing the second version of this sculpture. And that second version of the sculpture will be made with a, a biodegradable plastic. And I kind of thought about just using the biodegradable plastic from the start. Um, I had three different options. One worked much better than the others. Um, but instead I, I made samples of each of those biodegradable plastics for these forms. And um, those samples played out really interestingly. The, the one that I would have gone with um, completely disintegrated within about a month. So had I chosen that, this would have been a fail. Um, and so fortunately, one of the three biodegradable plastics is held up beautifully. So that's what I'll use for the next one. So that's a kind of a, a, an interesting kind of pragmatism that comes into some of these things where you want to make a certain kind of environmentally sustainable choice and when you do that and why you might, might not want to do that. Certainly open to that as a thread of conversation because it also loops all the way back to one of those early projects I showed you where in creating a superstructure for the wood that the termites are going to eat, I did use a resin to hold all that together. So we could unpack that if anybody's interested. Nice, nice. Um, Thank you. Sure. So then just because I think we're kind of getting close on time, just if we could pretty rapidly go through a couple of things. This is all I've got for, for reservoir. I just wanted to show you a couple of things we're building in the studio right now. So this is a piece um, that is going to be going in and you can just keep going through images as I speak, Eric. Um, a very enormous piece that's that's inspired by the, the root structure of a very old growth tree that um, is made entirely out of wood. So it's all Alaskan yellow cedar and it's, it's, the, it's the length of a commercial jet plane. And it's actually, we're seeing it here on the ground so that we can build it. But um, after a couple of these images, you'll see that if we took this and moved it 90 degrees, so if we believed that the floor was the wall, this is what it will look like. So here's a computer rendering. It's actually all coming off the wall. So the furthest part of the sculpture comes off the wall about 30 feet and you've got almost 90 feet in width and then it's about 60 feet tall. And this will be the introduction you'll have when you come into this new um, uh, terminal in the airport. You'll come up a pair of escalators directly underneath this piece and then you'll, you'll walk underneath a wall that it's attached to. And, and which airport was this? I'm sorry. Uh, Seattle Tacoma. Airport. Oh, okay. So it, you know, it, it's a, it's an interesting context for me um, because I'm bringing this this I you know issues of, of the natural world. It's a piece called Boundary, and it's really a, a, about the divide between underground and above ground. Um, so you're seeing the you're seeing a kind of a wrapping of root structure above it. What you're seeing here is another project that I'm working on for Microsoft. Microsoft's based out in Seattle and they're building an enormous new campus. And one of the main drivers of that campus is to put everything, all the automobiles under, underneath the campus. So they're building an enormous parking garage and creating all these new buildings. And one of the realities of that is that they had to take down many trees in order to do this. They're replacing all those trees by, by planting new, large trees. So there'll actually be more trees when they're finished than there were when they started, but it presented an opportunity for me. You can go to the next image. Um, there was this grove of oak trees that had to come down for where a building is going. So um, what I did with my team is we went in with um, very, very large vacs off pump trucks and pressure washers and completely removed all of the soil from the root structure of these interconnected trees. 
And one of the things, you know, you kind of have an idea of what this is going to look like. It's a very different thing to actually literally get to see it and to be part of that and examine it. Um, it's kind of like with another project I did, I had an opportunity to simply digitally scan a tree that we were going to base our sculpture on. And instead of doing that, I chose to spend two weeks making a 10,000 pound plaster mold of the tree. And those sorts of decisions are, are really built on how much you derive from actually walking through something instead of just kind of taking a quick cut and thinking you understand what it is. Because spending hours and days slowly unearthing these roots, you really learn so much about how they graft to one another and what they're doing structurally. If we can go to the next image. And you can just kind of keep going through these images too. They're just gonna show you what this process looked like as we were taking away all the soil. So after, after we removed all the soil, I came in with LIDAR, which gives you a, a, a perfectly um, accurate three-dimensional mesh down to every two millimeters of, of the 3D volumes of all of those roots. And we can play this little video. This is a, a first iteration of the sculpture. I'm working through the concepts on this piece right now, and it's changed since this moment here. But this is taking all of that, that three-dimensional information from those root scans and then applying it and altering it so that you can walk through those roots. So you see these sort of passages. And this is a pretty heavy video. So I don't know if you all are able to see the video. But in, in this iteration of the sculpture, it's an entirely metallic construction outdoors. And then as the sculpture is um, it's intersected by the plane of a building, it becomes wood on the interior space. And the idea is that that wood is, is the actual oak from these trees. So you're using the trees to make the sculpture of the trees, very kind of literal. And I think, yeah, I think we could, why don't we go through, we'll go into a couple of these other images. What I did here, that's really what I wanted to speak about, but I'm just gonna, if, if we could, Eric, there are another 10 images for us to just scroll through so that if people have images about any of my other projects, this is, this is what I had referred to about making this plaster cast of this tree. So it's a 130 foot tall tree. And this is um, where we protected the tree and then ferried up all these thousands of pounds of plaster. And then this is the sculpture that it's derived from. And, this sculpture keeps growing as we show it. So it's, it's not complete yet. The sculpture is 105 feet long. So we still have 25 feet of it to make. It grows with the scale of each exhibition space we, we show it in. And it's, this is the piece I also mentioned having more than 4,000 people help to construct. This is what it looks like looking through that. So each of these small pieces of wood is, is hand carved and cut and glued together based upon the molds that we took from that tree. And then the, the next project, if, if anybody wants to talk about, is called Murmur. And um, this is, this is a, a, a product, this is a kinetic piece. And so it opens and closes. And we can just go to the next image. It's derived from an Arctic landform called a pingo. You can see my wife standing in just for a sense of scale. So this top all opens. This is all made out of perforated wood, again, Alaskan yellow cedar. And then the next image shows you what it looks like to be inside this form with these, um, we custom fabricated these arms which are housing pneumatics and hydraulics uh, so that the piece can open and close uh, gradually over time. And part of the desire here was to speak to what this Arctic landform does as it implodes and, and sinks in and put the viewer inside that happening, but also the perforations on the sculpture. And you can keep going through the next couple of images um, mean that light is going through and you have this beautiful series of shadows raking all across the floor in a much faster rate than, than the movement of, of each of these fingers that's uncoiling and coiling. And this is a, I put this in here because there's so much that I, I like to talk about in terms of what it is to work with a team of people as opposed to work entirely by yourself or say with one collaborator, because it's a really interesting challenge and, and an opportunity to think about what do each of these 20 people bring to the table? It's, it's not so interesting for me to say, this is exactly what I would like you to accomplish in, as opposed to having a conversation about what are your interests? What do you wanna to bring to this? How are you gonna make an imprint into this larger project? If it you know, were somebody else, would this be a different project that you're helping make? And this is, this is the creation of a piece called Spur, 
which is inspired by lava tubes underground and was temporarily installed, I think we can see in the next image, um, at a place called Craters of the Moon National Park. So we torched the entire interior of this wood form to give it much more the feel of what it was like to be in those lava tubes. And we brought the negative space of that lava tube up onto the surface so that you could be above where they, they literally are in this national park and experience it, but have a sense of open quality to it. And then the very last two images will show you what this piece looks like as it ages, it's a huge part of what I'm interested in. Any of these pieces that go outdoors, what happens to this thing? What's, what's the sort of the trajectory of its life? Because everything, almost everything that I make is temporary. I have made pieces that are designed to fall apart over a very, very long period of time. It might take a hundred years. There's a cast iron piece that I did called Bastion, which is sort of comic, but it's designed to fall apart over about a, a 20,000 year span of time. So the corrosion and different thicknesses of that cast iron will give way over centuries of difference. This, this last image is showing you what the wood of spur is doing as it ages. And it's a very special wood. It was salvaged from the Tongass National Forest from a stand of trees that had been standing dead for a century. So these trees lived to about 600 years and then about hundred years ago, all of their roots froze killing the grove of trees. And somebody that I know got, it's almost like a lottery, the permit to come in and take out a couple of those trees to salvage. And he sold me that wood. And, and so having wood with that kind of a history, um, I love its, its kind of story, but also it's such hardy wood that this will be here for, something will happen with a kind of human intervention long before the material itself will, will go away. So that's what I have as, as far as images and, and any sort of questions to, to run through together would be wonderful. Thank you so much, John. Um, Mark was uh, Mark is in the audience, so he 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 Glad has with... checked in. Yeah, <laughs> um, but he had a question. Was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the the piece that you're installing in in Charlotte uh, in, in next month. Is that what you said? Yeah, we're hoping it's next month. So we've 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 been running into and I, and I shared this America that that we've run into an interesting problem. Um, the sculpture is going in a place called Marsh Park. So the idea is that the sculpture is very specific to that location, and there are these beautiful grasses and sedges, and it's a, a floodplain. So I became very interested in the the root structure of those sedges. So the sculpture is really formally derived around blowing up one of those forms so that we can look through it at the landscape. So it's, it's almost like the pores in that root structure are what um, we're framing the landscape with by looking through. And the, the interesting challenge we've run into is because it's a floodplain, we knew that every hundred years we were gonna have these storm events, which meant that some to some degree, the bottom of the sculpture would flood. So we were talking about a foot or two of water would come up for a number of hours. And I, I thought that was very interesting. I, I, the idea that we would get this kind of water line on the sculpture over time. The sculpture is made out of purple heart, which is a, it's a kind of a cousin to Ipe. So very hard wood, um, almost so dense that it's not buoyant. So also another good thing. So it has to lock into a concrete footing on the site. But um, we found out about a month ago that we're subject to more like 11 feet underwater. So the, the sculpture is about 12 feet tall. And, and that's really even based on not even the most current science. So realistically, this thing is going to be 15 feet underwater. You know, it's going to be completely underwater. And our geotech um, told us that we had such forces of not the buoyancy, but there were these uplift forces that it would just carry the whole sculpture away. And we had to bring in a number of different um, engineers who really didn't think that his calculations were accurate. And so we kind of worked that through with him and he sort of changed what he was saying. So basically we've all determined it's not gonna float away. So a little less stress. Now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now we're, we're okay to make this, this foundation. I mean, it's kind of amazing to think that we're talking about a 17,000 pound foundation and the sculpture itself is 7,000 pounds that that would just sort of float away in the water. And theoretically it won't now. Um, so yeah. we're good to make that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a little frustrating for me with, with COVID that, you know, this didn't time out because I would have, you know, I'm going to be there and, and to be able to meet with people in person. And 
who knows, this, this could go on for another couple of months, there can be delays. And if, if we do run into a situation where I'm out in Charlotte and it's in December and things have gotten better and we can do anything in person, I would, I would love to come and, and get to meet some of the students in person and, and, and do some of that more interactive stuff. Yeah, that would be that would be great. But it, it sounds like, I, uh, again, the way you're working with the the landscape and the ecology of the the place or the geology of the place in, in this in this case is, is going to be inter really interesting. Um, the, uh, someone had a question about where uh, where is Marsh Park. So John had mentioned that at the beginning, and I, I did get a chance to look it up. So it's it, like you said, John, it's uh, it looks like it's southeast. It's near the Ashbrook Clausen Village. Marsh Road Park um, is, is the full name of it. It's on the, the southeast side um, off of Scott Avenue. Um, so, so yeah, you said time-wise uh, it, it's uh, scheduled to be, uh, you'll be here in a month or so, right? Yeah, and I, I'm when I say that cautiously, it could be two months. What right. I we're also we're, we're just updating my website. So when the website and it will be updated before this happens, I'll have the actual street address, like the GPS location for it. So if anybody just wants to go to the website in the upcoming section, there'll be a way to find exactly where it is. Nice, nice. So That's great. That too. Um, oh, there's there's lots of let's see. Um, there's a couple of questions coming in. What are the what are the biggest challenges working on um, a public arts project? Um, you know, particularly issues with protecting you know your integrity as the artist and, and the concept and the politics around you know uh, dealing with with an object in a public space. Could you talk a little bit about negotiating all of those? things <laughs> i could probably spend three hours i mean it's it, it, <laughs> that's it's a separate really, presentation yeah. <laughs> it really is but um and and it and so i'll try to answer some of some of that it's it's extraordinarily challenging um especially the larger the projects get and then and also in different contexts so this this piece that i'm making for the airport right now the port is a is a very regulated environment and so you're subject to so many different voices with you know very practical concerns um but i would say and, and then i'm also right now we're almost finished in my studio with a large scale sculpture that's going into a new u.s embassy in guatemala so there you're dealing with kind of these different international issues um, of regulation and an embassy is a, is a kind of fortress um so you're dealing with very practical safety issues, life safety issues, which you're going to have, you know, in terms of engineering with any of these projects and installation, they're just sort of heightened. Um, it, it's a kind of a funny juxtaposition between the public art world and the museum world, because for whatever reason, my experience is, you know, in, in a couple dozen museum installations is that you really don't have a whole lot of regulations. You just kind of have these very kind of frank conversations and come to agreements with, with people and you do things as safely as you know how. But with the, with the public art, that's a very different thing. I think um, maybe what's more, um, I think in terms of people wanting or being willing to follow your concept, um, I really haven't found pushback on that. I've really found people respect the integrity of why it is that you're wanting to do something. So I've had very little uh, people trying to influence what it is that I'm making. Um, what I do find can be problematic is what's going on in the immediate environment around what you're making. So there can be architectural choices or um, just programming choices that can kind of counteract what you're trying to achieve. And, and, and too often you come in as the artist after so much of the architecture has already been designed. So from that architect's perspective and from the people who are trying to create programming for a space, all of a sudden you come in with a large intervention and it sort of takes away what their intent was. You know, you, you make a space with some negative space in it. So there's some room to breathe. And then here comes this person just filling that right up. So that's a, a really kind of an interesting dance. What I think for me with the, with the big picture, the two things that I've found um, in working with, with public art is that I have to learn so many other skills beyond what it is to come up with a good idea, how to create that thing and how to install it there's the, the diplomacy factor is enormous. And so I think some of us are gonna find we have that in us and some of us aren't. And so I think that it's a totally viable thing if that's not your skill set. 
Um, I think you find support, you get somebody that can be, uh, you know, an advocate for you that can take on a lot of that work, if that's really not your thing, because I think that's often not an artist's thing, you know, to sort of have some of those, those skills, um, but plenty of artists do. So that, that's been an interesting one to just sort of find how much I have to draw from different parts of myself, then certainly I, I never would have thought of that when I was a student. Yeah, it's I, I, it's interesting. I didn't think about um, the you know with all the factors in a in a public art piece. Then the you know the the kind of um, you know roles of the architect versus the the artist, and then how those come together. And I remember an interview with like Richard Serra years ago that he said you know how much he hated architects, <laughs> you know, just having You're to deal with confrontational guy. Yes, yes, but but I, I it's it is it's um it, you know the whether it's the pragmatics of of the diplomacy or or the literal how you're gonna make something in that space it, it's it's a really interesting negotiation but I I think like with the Microsoft uh, commission that that you showed it, it's it's really interesting how you re, how you use all those factors to really respond in a in a really inspirational way to to the space so mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think back to i think maybe the most difficult project i've had logistically is a is a piece that i made um, this is it's in a history museum and the history museum is on the national register of historic places which means you really can't make any changes to the building unless you have very, very good, good reason. So for the sculpture that I wanted to make, um, I, I had to go to these, you go to, a, you go to a city meeting and then a county and eventually you get all the way to the feds and everybody has to sign off on this thing. So I'm starting off at the city and the group of people that went to present their proposal before me to a different historical building were asking to change some awnings on the front of the building from taupe to white and they were rejected. And then I came in and I'm asking to cut an eight foot hole through the bottom of the building, another eight foot hole through the top of the building so that my sculpture can completely dissect the building and go into the water below. And we, we made it happen, but it, oh, I nice. mean, it, it was extraordinary to try to, you know, you, cause you know, my, the, the whole idea for me was that we have a history museum and it's on the site. It's actually, it's on a pier over water, but this was all old growth forest. And so I wanted to honor the actual broader history of the environment, which would have been all these old growth trees. And so I really was honoring history. And so it, it's just a, how do you frame these arguments? And then also, how do you do some kind of some trades and some compromise? And, and in this case, they allowed me to cut through the floor of the building, but they didn't allow me to cut through the, the ceiling of the building. And so the sculpture is so tall, the sculpture is about 65 feet tall. When you're standing inside it, you should be looking through the sculpture into the into the sky above. Instead, we put a scrim with a video monitor and we just projected um, the exact weather, but from a year earlier. So it, it kind of became an interesting opportunity. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't show them the real thing. Anybody that's standing inside that sculpture is looking up and they just think they're looking at the sky. But then if they actually you know, hear the real story, they're actually looking at the sky a year ago. So it's actually maybe more interesting because we have this idea of, of time change. So, you know, how do you take these, you know, these negotiations in a way where each negative or, or obstacle becomes an opportunity to make it something more interesting, I guess. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, that works so well with uh, the experience of history, right? Even the sky is this little meta history within the sculpture. That's beautiful. Nice. And that we make assumptions, right? That things aren't changing or that mm -hmm. they are, you know you don't really in terms of the sense you don't notice it most of the time right right oh very cool um there uh let's see there's a question about the large um tree sculpture the i, I forget the name but the one that uh you did the plaster yeah um so a question about that it's it's actually growing as it as it change, uh, as it moves or, or gets displayed in different spaces. Um, and there's, <clears throat> maybe you could, the question is really talking about um, how you negotiate that, which would be, you know, transporting the pieces that are there into the space while also readying it to be adapted to the new space. Yeah, that's that's been a really exciting project because it it started um, with a commission from the Smithsonian Museum where they asked me to make a piece. So I took uh, enough of the the tree to fill that space, 
so I knew the space that I had. And so each of those limbs from the tree, they kind of went all the way until they just about met the walls and the length of the tree. So it was, it was about 45 feet long. And that, that was um, then followed up by a really unique opportunity, which was um, there's something called the World Economic Forum um, that happens every year in Davos, Switzerland, where business leaders and heads of state meet to just sort of talk about the state of the world's economy and more broad issues, social issues. And they've been stepping up their art program. So they asked if I could actually send the piece to them. And part of the idea of, of having it grow each time is that wherever I'm sending it, people are actually working on the sculpture itself while it's there to grow it into its space. Oh, okay. So, you know, when it's in DC, people are working on it. When we took it to the Smithsonian, you have people working on it. But what was wonderful about this is you've got the president of Mexico sitting next to the CEO of ExxonMobil. And you've, you, you know, you've got these very powerful people who at first they would just kind of, you know, do two little pieces as a photo op. But then you'd find that they come back and they're working on it for an hour together as they have their meeting the next day. So it's, it's a project that, that, that not only encapsulates the changing spaces that it goes into, but it, it takes the, the audience that experienced it and chose to participate in it. Very and cool. We've got one other fold to it. And I have, we don't have time to do everything, but technology is a really big piece about how, uh, of how I design things now. So almost everything that, that is designed in my studio, we, we use HoloLens so that we can make a, um, a a three-dimensional object, a hologram, and experience the piece in space together to make change scales. We can animate it if it's a kinetic piece. So we're, we've made a whole kinetic, uh, excuse me, a whole um, virtual piece where you've got the sculpture and you can actually be building it, but it's not real pieces. So it's, it's, it's sort of something that opens up a whole other plane of thinking. That's awesome. Yeah, there. Um, we've got uh, maybe time for for one more question. And there was a, a question from the senior thesis class um, about how you, you know, you you have this this kind of structure, right, or, or pattern a lot of times in the work that that seems to initiate the the overall composition, maybe. It, um, but then how, how does that, it, maybe you could describe how that leads you into the overall form. Cause sometimes it, it seems to be very amor amorphous. Do you have like the form planned out uh, all the way through and then it's just kind of production or as the production goes, does the form evolve? Does that make sense? I think so. There's, there's, yeah. there's a couple of really interesting things to there to me. So each, each is unique. If, if we look at the piece that was called Spur that was designed based on the space of a lava tube, mm -hmm. the structure of that evolved into wanting to mimic a, a railroad tie kind of composition and tracks because that had to do with that local history. So that local history and that means of transport then became the kind of logic for why you have a, you know, I wanted a linear open form for that sculpture but it made sense to that actual environment for it to, to echo the railroad. So mm -hmm. that kind of becomes the logic to the, to the building block. You know, there's this, there's this sense of perforation which runs through most of the object type based, you know, if I make a large object as opposed to a field of small objects. And it's, that's really largely driven by wanting to experience an interiority of a sculpture while still understanding it within the context of its environment. And then I, the second part of that to me that, that's really interesting has to do with, I will have that overall form, um, but how we get to that form can't be resolved for me. I don't, I don't even want it 50% resolved. I want to make sure that the way I structure these projects is I have two people in my studio who are leads on each project. So they really own a lot of the, the kind of practical day-to-day -day big picture to see that we're tracking on schedule and, and that things are being made. Um, and then they have a team. And so it, that whole team really needs to sort of think about the why, like what are we trying to achieve with, with this sculpture? And so we're doing a, this piece for this Guatemalan embassy and, and there's a kind of a logic to how you get these growths on it. So we kind of have these conversations every week, every week and, and evolve. And so, so much comes from how somebody is making something and one person finds a way to certain, make a certain twist in a small way on a form. And we all really respond to it because it ties into the concept. Now all of a sudden three or four people are riffing off that twist 
And then we see in the end, one of the most dynamic and interesting aspects of that sculpture are these sort of irregular twisting forms that were never even part of that original piece. And it's just, it's evolving through that, that process of multiple people working. And the other part I'd put on that is those two people that are leading on that project, that's not all they do. They're, they're spending half of their time on another project where somebody else is leading. So it's not like you have a class of leaders and a class of workers. You're just taking those different roles. If you're having a day where you're thinking, you know, I'm feeling ambitious and I'm really firing on all cylinders, I'll be doing my lead role. If you're just, you know, you drank last night and you're hungover, you're gonna go work on the other end of it. So it's like, there's a kind of pragmatism, but also how do you pull from everybody what they've got when they've got it? Mm -hmm. maybe that answer is there more to follow up on that or does that feel like no that i think i it, it was it was kind of uh you know an uh an aesthetic and product production question that that the this nicole had um and i think that makes a lot of sense and and two there i i think it also addresses some of the questions about how as a as an artist you you, you negotiate that uh, staffing and, and facility that you've got working with other people. And for, you know, for me, it, 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 it it's reminiscent, um, and the students know I use this analogy a lot, but it's, you know, like, you know, you're, you're creating a, a, a piece with a group as if you're, you know, working on a movie and, you know, you're directing or you're, um, you know, creating music in a band or something that, you know, you're really counting on, um uh, you know your your other musicians your other players to to bring something new and to the uh, to the improv and everybody is kind of pushing you know playing a lead and then backing off or you know uh so it's it's really interesting um to hear all that um and uh there there's a lot of uh i um comments um this is how good of a talk this been this has been and, and they really enjoyed seeing your work so Appreciate thank you so much john yeah i'm glad to be here and again if there's any way we can do any follow-up when i'm actually out there who knows what what it allows but i i just miss the fact that i don't get to see these faces and hear these questions from all the students that's always something that i, I really like so if there's any way we can do any kind of follow-up i'd love it yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, either through, you know, you have my contact, but we'll check out, I'll, I'll share the, the website with everybody. So we can kind of uh, touch base about the project. But yeah, it'd be great to know. And we have started hybrid classes. So, you know, there, there would be a possibility. And um, yeah, it, it's great that you're, you're willing to do that. We really appreciate it. So absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you so much, John. This has been a real pleasure and uh, yeah, very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for having me.